Michael, Mr. Spock 1 here again, bringing you part 2 on the NOS 2 operating system by the professor. This is a bit longer video, so I'll let him get right to it. But I would like to add that I have added some shortened notes and subtitles throughout the video by Discord member William, our in-house NOS specialist. And now, here's the professor. Hello, welcome back. I want to discuss now the interactive access facility. So I want to show you how to connect to the mainframe with an interactive session and explore some commands with you, namely commands related to files and uh, execution and submission of jobs and stuff like that. But uh, this will just uh, scratch the surface of what we can do with an interactive session. But all I'm going to talk, I read in two manuals, essentially, this one and uh, that one. So the volume two of the reference set is kind of a starter guide, <coughs> a guide to system usage. Uh, if we go to this, maybe you see that uh, they're explaining the job processing, the files, and local permanent. I'm going to discuss this a little bit magnetic tape processing, flow of command procedure, those are the equivalents of uh, scripts, I believe, or C list libraries and stuff like that. So there's a lot of information. I'm just going to discuss a little about it. And this manual of a system command over there is about uh, 800 pages. So there's a lot of commands concerning a lot of aspects of the system. So there's just no way that I can go through all of this, but it's uh, a lot to explore if you start to uh, do it like I, like I did, okay? So first things first is to make the connection. I don't know exactly how it went in, in, at the time because I never work on a cyber system or a cyber mainframe and I don't know about the, the kind of terminals that were connected to them. But apparently for this uh, emulator, what you have to do is a simple, well, uh, a telnet session on a specific port, uh, port uh, 6610, and uh, we, uh, we will end up being uh, uh, accessing, you know, the, the, inter, uh, the interactive access uh, facility, and we can log on to the system this way. So let me first do it uh, with just a telnet client. We're going to discuss the terminal emulator a little bit more uh, later, but for the moment, let me just use you know, a plain uh, X-term window like this, and I'm going to make a telnet uh, session or telnet connection to the mainframe like this, to the port 6610. Now the mainframe is answering, as you can see. Welcome to the NOS software system, copyright control data. At this point, I'm going to put my uh, telnet client in mode character because it's going to answer better this way. Uh, so I escape to telnet and define the mode character. I would, I wish I could do it before making the connection, but I have to do it after the connection is done. And then I got this, but uh, I press enter again. He complains about an improper login, but that's okay. Now he's asking the family because uh, the user names or the, the accounts, if you wish, are grouped in families. But you just type uh, enter at this point. Because the probably because once you specify the the uh, username, it uh, defines the family automatically. And then now I'm going to use the uh, username or the account of Tom Hunter, the one that's already on the system, uh, to make my life easier. And I guess at the beginning you better use this one <laughs> than try to create yourself a, a new uh, account. Uh, so T Hunter like this, and the password is pass me. We saw it before. P A S S M E. And then you get this very short answer. First of all, you get the job sequence name of the interactive session itself. That's the triple A I in this case. So that's the job sequence uh, name you want to use in a kill command on the console if you get stuck in your connection, okay? 
And then uh, this uh, slash that you see there is actually a prompt. Okay, so now we type commands and the system will answer. So as, at this point, we have essentially, you know, a text interface with a prompt and you type commands and you get answers. Okay, but uh, this uh, text interface is much more, as I said, uh, I think much more sophisticated than uh, TSO, the ready prompt, you know, the TSO ready prompt. Because as I said, you have this system commands, uh, 800 pages, you know, the explaining all kinds of, of things you can do. So now at this point, what I want to discuss is the notion of files on this uh, system. There are essentially two kinds of files. Don't rant at me if I'm not a perfectly uh, right with what I'm going to say in this video because I'm just learning this, this thing. But apparently there are two kinds of files permanent files and local files. A local file is just a temporary working file you're going to use in your session. And typically they're going to be uh, destroyed or released at the end of the session and disappear and they won't be there the next time you're going to connect. You're just going to create new local files with your new session. Permanent files, like the name indicates, is a file that's going to survive your session unless you purge it before uh, leaving the, the system. So <coughs> permanent files are divided in two. Uh, there are indirect access permanent files and direct access permanent files. This is uh, slightly different from what we understand on MVS. A direct access file is a file that <laughs> literally you access directly. It means that when you work on it, you you work on the copy that's uh, permanent on disk, you know, directly. And uh, you don't use a local file to do uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, while an indirect access file is precisely a file that exists on the disk. And to work on it, you have first to make a copy of it as a local file. You work the local file or the local copy, or the temporary copy. You possibly merge a new... Uh, local files uh, to it, or make changes, edit, uh, do all kinds of stuff. And then at the end, or at some point, you might save the work as a permanent file or replace what you had uh, before by the new uh, local file that you just uh, manipulate. Okay, so basically uh, any direct access, you make a copy, work the copy, and then save the, the copy. While for a direct access, you essentially, uh, as you're going to see, you attach it, so you, you create some kind of a link, if you wish, and you work directly on the on the permanent file. Uh, at the beginning, I was a little bit confused by that, but it turned out that it's, I feel it's easier to work with indirect access files. After all, you just make the copy, and then when you're done, you just do the... Uh, you save the, the results, okay? So how do you get the list of your permanent files? Uh, you use the command cat list. As you can see, I have here five indirect access files and one direct access file. Actually, if you log on this account from a freshly download uh, uh, turnkey, you will have only these two here, okay? So the, the others that are there, are actually files I created myself for the sake of this uh, video. So uh, they are they contain different uh, stuff, as, uh, essentially uh, Fortran programs anyway. So uh, this is how you get the list of your uh, permanent files. And if you want the list of your local files or temporary files, you can type the command inquire comma f and then you're going to get the local file information. That's where you learn that you have these uh, two, by default, you have these two uh, local files called input, output. The way I see them, you know, they, they behave a little bit like a standard input and standard output on a Unix system. Okay. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Moreover, among the local files, there is one special uh, local file called the primary file. Okay, that file is the actually the it's kind of the the, um, the it's the, it's your working file, your uh, 
<coughs> preferred working file, if you wish, the, the, the file that you can use. And typically with commands, you don't have to give the name and everything. And it behaves uh, nicely to you, essentially. So it's, it's kind of a special local file that you're going to work with it, uh, work with uh, more than the other. And typically what you do, you make one of the local file your primary file, you work with it, and then you change the primary file to something else and so on, because it makes your life uh, easier, as you're going to see. So, uh, so <clears throat> for the moment, I have no... Uh, I have no primary file. For example, if I type the command list, it, it will try to list the content of the primary file. So if I do that, there is no primary file for the moment. So it complains that there are no primary files. That's fine. <coughs> but if there was one, it would list the content of the primary file without having to give it a name and without saying, you know, list primary file or something like that. So now, uh, suppose I want to create a local file. I can use an editor for that, but I'm not going to do that for the moment. I can <coughs> work, let's say, one of these uh, indirect access files. So to get a local copy uh, of an indirect access file, what you do, you type uh, get and the name of the indirect access file. So let's say DOMC. If I inquire, you can see now that I have among the local files this uh, DUMC, which is a copy of that one. Okay. Uh, the, you get to hear the information about the length or the size of the file. PRU stands for physical record units. So that's an indication of the size of the file. And you have also the type. So LO is uh, local. The primary file is going to have a different type here, as you're going to see. And the status, I'll be uh, back to this uh, in a few minutes. So now, what can you do with this uh, DOMC? Well, now you can try to list it, but you have to give the name because it's not the primary file. So list file DOMC, and that's it. And if I do inquire, and if you are observant, the, st the status has changed. Okay, I'll be uh, back to this. Now, this one, I can make my primary file. Uh, so it's a local file I have. I can have another local file if I want. I can get, uh, you know, cat list. Uh, if I wish, I can get also, uh, let's say, bird. Now, if I do this, you can see that I have both BIRD and DOMC as local files, so these two copies. You see the difference here? The BIRD is BOI, while the other one is EOI. BOI means the beginning of information, EOI means end of information. So essentially this file is at the beginning, it's like you have the, it's and the, the, there's a file positioning, you know, and for this one we are at the beginning, while for the other one we are at the end, essentially. And now, if I want to make, uh, let's say, DOMC my uh, my primary file, I just use uh, old DOMC like this. And now, if I do this, you, know, you can see that uh, DOMC became my primary file, and apparently my bird just disappeared. So watch out. <coughs> Sometimes it has uh, some effects like that. Uh, if you don't want to uh, the others to be dropped like this, yeah, there's a, a command or a, uh, an option, I believe, in the in the command old. But now, if I do list, you know, I should be I should get my my file as before, but I don't have to give the name, okay? Uh, and if I inquire now, uh, I see that DOMC is again at the beginning of the uh, information, so. I'm still at the beginning of the of the file. <coughs> uh, <coughs> that that's about it. Uh, now, uh, if I want to save this, let's say for example, I made some changes to DOMC, and now I want to keep a copy. So what you do, you just save uh, and the name of the of the local file. Of course, here, if I try to do this, he's going to complain there is already one permanent there. 
So you have to do a replace, I believe, if you want, or you save it onto another name, something like this. Let's say Toto. If I do cat list, now I have DOMC and I have Toto. Uh, okay. If you want to get rid of Toto, you do purge Toto. And you can actually uh, write more files if you wish. Okay, now cat list. Toto is no longer there. Uh, I believe that uh, DOMC, our primary file, is still uh, is still there. If I want to get rid of DOMC as a local file, I just return it. I return DOMC. And now I don't have any uh, primary file anymore. Uh, and you notice that if I save, uh, if I save uh, Toto like this. It created an indirect access file. What if I want to create a direct access file? Well, instead of saving, what you do, you define. So let's say I get this uh, DOMC again, and then I define DOMC equal Toto, I believe. And if I do cat list, now I have Toto as a direct access file. I can purge it with the same command like this. Okay. All right, so that's how to uh, basically save files and get uh, files to, to be local so that you can work on them. If you want to access, let's say, this DOMCJ, which is a job actually, okay, so you don't get it because it's already a permanent, uh, it's a direct access. So if I try to do get like this, He's going to say, well, that's direct access, so you cannot make a copy. What you do, you attach instead. Attach the OMC. Okay. Enquiry F. And now I have this, this guy. All right. <coughs> uh, the OMC J, and I can uh, list it. That's about the same, but as a job at the beginning here, there are some instructions for job execution. Okay, I'm gonna clear the whole thing. So you can do return star, that's gonna clear all the local files. Okay, now I'm doing this uh, very often because I hate having all these files in different states. Uh, <clears throat> typically what I do is I get the the file and then I edit or work on it. Uh, maybe I should explain a little bit now about the structure of a file as such. Uh, uh, so let me uh, show you this thing here. A file is composed, as I understand it, of records, but a record is a logical structure in NOS, so it's not necessarily just a line. It can be several lines so you have a record, it, it's a bunch of information with lines or just one line, so a bunch of uh, character or stuff. And you a file is typically composed of a, a certain number of records uh, separated by this end of record uh, uh, indicator and the end of the file is there. So in a file you will have typically the beginning of information something that tells the system that the files start there. There is an end of information. You don't get to see that, but you can imagine that in your head, I guess. And inside these two bound uh, boundaries, you have the records separated by end of record. And the last one is possibly end of file. And it's possible to create what they call a multiple, a multi-file file. That is a file containing several files. So that's an example here. You have this first file containing two records, and the second file with just one record, and the last one with three uh, records. I guess it's easier to work with a, a file containing only one file, and easier if there is only one record. But it's possible, you know, to create with several records, and that will happen typically if you merge uh, uh, files together. So you just take the records from one and you merge with the records of the other one. That's you, and then you have a, a multi-record uh, file. So remember, the, 
the record is a logical structure, so it can be several lines. But uh, at the beginning, you know, I guess uh, when you start, especially if you create a, a first file, you must have probably just one record, essentially. And then it's only if you manipulate these records or uh, different files that you're going to get a, a file with more records. I'll give you an example of what's happening. Uh, that's the bird uh, file there. See that bird uh, file? That's actually a file with two records. DOMC and the other one that I created have just one record, but this bird has two records, so let me get bird first. And then uh, I'm going to copy uh, copy uh, character record from bird into a new local file called A, and I'm going to copy just one record. Okay, so as you can see, he reached the end of record. That's one record, and there were five lines, okay? Because Bird contains two records. The first record is a small program, an Hello Word program, and the second record is actually the DOMC program over there. So if now I do copy CR Bird B1, uh, I'm going to copy the second record which contains 99 lines, and now I have these two files, A and B, and if I list uh, A, sorry, F equal A, like this, this is my first program, if I list uh, F equal B, that's the second one, and if I list uh, bird, I have the two, okay? You can see right at the beginning here, the first program is there, and then the second program. So this one is in one record, and this one is in a second record, okay? Uh, so that that's what it is. So uh, as you can see, again, uh, I just list, which put myself, uh, you know, uh, a system at the end of the of the, of the files, there is this notion of file positioning along the records, you know, so you can progress, you, are, you can be at the beginning of information, and then you work a certain amount of records, or you skip records, and then you are at certain position in the file, and you can copy records from there, and so on. So you have to be careful, because this uh, status can lead to sometimes behavior that's uh, hard to understand. So, uh, <clears throat> let me show you, let me uh, return uh, everything, so that uh, I'm not... Uh, so, I'll give you an example. Let's say I get this uh, DOMC. Uh, so, DOMC is there, and I'm at the beginning of the file, okay? And now I'm going to compile this with Fortran. That's a Fortran program, so the, the Fortran compiler is FTN. I for input and the name of the file. If I'm right, it should work and give me the, the thing like this, and then I can load and go to execute. That's going to take about uh, 20 seconds, so it's computing the price of a uh, <coughs> down and out call option by Monte Carlo simulation. That's my fetish uh, program I use on all the systems. <laughs> Usually, uh, I, I I take the PL1 version, but I translate it to Fortran for the sake. Okay, so the price is 17, which means the program is, uh, has no error. Okay, but now let's say I return the thing, and then I start again, but this time I do a list, F equal DOMC, and then I try to compile. It was very short, and if I do LGO, I get an empty load file. That's because if I do this, after the list, my position is at the end of this file, okay? I'm no longer at the beginning of the file, I'm at the end of the file, and uh, the compiler, when I give the, <laughs> the input, you know, he's trying to compile statements from the position where he is, where the file is, 
And because there is nothing after the end of the file, it's not compiling anything, and that explains the very short time here. And of course, the, uh, the executable is empty, so there's nothing there. So what do you do with this when you typically have to rewind the file? Okay, even though if it's a, a file on disk, you rewind it and inquire. Now I'm at the beginning, so I believe at this point, if it doesn't, doesn't do a trick on me, I should be able to compile like this. And now the LGO should, uh, should work, because uh, if I inquiry, I have this LGO, which the size is 10, so it's not an empty file. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, okay? So uh, that could be annoying a little bit. So one way to avoid this is to make uh, DOMC your primary file, because when you work with the primary file, whatever you do on it is going to rewind it automatically. So in most of the case, uh, you won't see any difference, okay? So if you are to work on a specific uh, source file to compile and execute and stuff like that, make it your uh, your primary file. It's going to be uh, better. So let me again clean this. Uh, can't list. There is this DOMCJ. That's a, a job. Uh, it's actually the same program DOMC that we have here. But it's, uh, I have added at the beginning the few commands to submit uh, the, the job for uh, execution in batch from this uh, interactive access uh, facility uh, connection. Okay, so I attach this guy, DOMCJ, okay. and uh, <coughs> And uh, at the beginning, let me do this. Hopefully, I'm not, not going to be at the end of. The, uh, I will see. You will see essentially what we saw for batch execution. First, you have this uh, job card. Well, uh, of course, now we are inside the IAF, so we type a slash job with the job name, and then we slash uh, we enter slash user that will generate automatically the user and the password and everything and then ftn to compile and lgo to load and go execute <clears throat> and as before you know as i had with uh, execution from the card reader i have to put an end of record at this point you know and you do it not with a tilde eor but with a slash eor and then you put this program there, okay? And uh, what it means essentially is that uh, when I, I do FTN here, it's gonna look for an input, and the, the input is you know, the program, and it's gonna take it at the input, which is the, the deck, if you wish, and it's gonna be the next record in this, uh, this deck. So if you want to submit this, let me inquire just for the sake of it. All right, so maybe I rewind this. I don't know if I absolutely necessary, but I'm gonna play safe. All right, and then you submit the name of the job, of the file, and you have to give a destination where you want the output to go. And if you say BC, it's gonna get printed, okay? And now you have the job sequence name, and if you want to know what happened with this job, you just inquire about it, JSN, like this. Now I learned that uh, this uh, job J over there is executing. The triple AI, that's actually my uh, interactive session executing. If I do inquire like this, uh, JSN, now this it, <coughs> there's just my interactive uh, session. So it means that the output uh, has been sent to the printer. At this point, I should do an RP77 uh, and then uh, convert the, the result or examine the result if I wish, okay? But uh, maybe you want to keep the output. Huh? I'll look at it uh, on the, the terminal. So what you have to do now is to do submit like this, but you don't type BC, you type uh, two like this. As you can see now it's triple A K. Executing. Uh, 
And at some point, it's going to tell me that it's on queue. Oh, sorry. Uh, idle fashion inquire f. No, not f. Uh, sorry, JSN. Okay, now it's in the queue. So it's waiting in queue. So I, I have to get the job from the queue and uh, save it as a local file if I want. So you do that with the queue get command. Then you type the name of the... Now, at this point, you have two uh, piece of information regarding the job. You have this uh, AAAK, that's the job sequence number, but there's also what is called a UJN, the user job name. It's a little bit like a job name and a job number on MVS. So when you talk about a job, you can refer to it with, by the name of the job or by the job number. So over here, what you do in the beginning, the first element is the job sequence name like this, and then you have to tell it's in the wait queue because it can be in a different kind of queue. And then you have to type here the name, the UJN, but if you don't remember, that's okay. You just uh, put like this, uh, just uh, an empty field if you wish. And then you have to give the name of the local file that's gonna contain this output. So let's call it Toto for the, the sake. And now the queue get is complete. If I do this, you can see Toto. If I list Toto, that should be the output of my uh, thing. So that's the kind of output. I have my price, uh, $17. I have this part, which is, remember, the part of the day file concerning my the execution of this job. Okay, <clears throat> so basically that's what it is. So I showed you how to uh, get local co get copies of indirect access files or attach direct access files at that point you can manipulate the files if you wish uh, i'm going to show that later in another uh, video and then you can uh, execute interactively if you wish in that case it's better to make it uh, your primary file or you can submit uh, the, the whole thing for execution and batch and uh, check the result uh, uh, with the queue get. And there's a lot of other things you can do, of course, but uh, this is just uh, scratching the surface, as I said. Now, uh, one last thing regarding this. Uh, <coughs> well, before I do that one last thing, let's go back here maybe to this uh, thing. As I said, <coughs> uh, there you have this chapter, as you can see, explaining the job structure processing and stuff like that. Then you have notion, general notion regarding the files, as I said, beginning of information, end of information, end of record, end of file. You have uh, information about input and output. Uh, this you can you have to use also when you program in Fortran, for example. You have to tell that uh, you want to write to output or you want to write to a tape or you want to write to somewhere else. Then you have this chapter about uh, local files, about permanent files and uh, different kinds. Uh, and then you have this chapter about NOS procedures. As I said, I believe these are the equivalent of CLIS or something like that, so it's probably. And then there's also this chapter about libraries because I haven't discussed that, but it's possible to create libraries of source, I guess, and libraries of object modules or and libraries of executable files, most probably. So there are utilities for that, which I haven't discussed so far, but uh, it's possible to use them. And I'm pretty sure it's possible to do it both uh, with an interactive session or in batch. Actually, uh, what happens is that, as you, as you could see, what we do in batch is essentially uh, mimicking the, the commands that we would do in uh, and in an interactive uh, session, so so there's no JCL, uh, com well, not complicated, but uh, JCL like MVS, you know, is just a bunch of commands and records and stuff like that. So uh, basically, I assume that most of the stuff that you can do uh, with an interactive commands and stuff like that, you can put in a, a file and submit to the batch uh, for execution in the background like that either from the back uh, from the card reader or from uh, the interactive session anyway 
so that that's uh, certainly interesting. Uh, there's also elements like that. Okay, let me check the other one over here. There's a lot of stuff there, even more than in the first one. Uh, again, you have files, procedures, and command processing, and then you can see that there are different kinds of commands. Flow control, job control commands, commands for interactive jobs, uh, file management commands, that's where the copy, the, the get, and the save, and the, everything is uh, happens. Permanent file commands, library maintenance, tape management, system utilities, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of commands depending on the kind of task you want to realize. There is this FTP, not sure exactly what it is. I don't think it's exactly what we hope, but I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, file transfer in another uh, video anyway. So uh, let me close this maybe. At this point, one last thing, or two last things. How do you quit, uh, log off, or buy? Okay which I'm going to do later. But uh, this is prompt, you can see, is actually uh, the prompt of the batch subsystem. Uh, <coughs> the batch I.O. maybe, I don't know. Uh, anyway, when you make this uh, connection to IAF, you work with a system. There are different, or subsystems, there are different subsystems available. The batch one is the one with this prompt like there. And the one I'm using, and they recommend to use most uh, most of the time. But you can uh, also use different uh, other subsystems. There is one called Access, which I believe uh, you can use to make file file transfers and stuff like that, if I remember well. And there are two interesting ones which are basic and Fortran. So, what are the language the languages available on this? system, you have four, essentially. You have assembler, which is called Compass in the CDC world. Then you have basic, COBOL, and Fortran. So if you are a basic programmer, you have a good uh, basic uh, compiler on there. And then there are these subsystems. There is the basic subsystems uh, system and the Fortran subsystem. There is no COBOL subsystem, if I remember well. But when you are, let's say, in a Fortran subsystem, you have a certain amount of commands that you can do, and you you can basically program in Fortran interactively. Let me show you. I will do it very quickly. I'm going to do a Hello World program in this subsystem. So now, uh, this is pretty much empty. OK, so you start Fortran like this. He's going to ask. Uh, for the primary file. Is it an old primary file or a new one or one from a library? So I'm going to create a new one, uh, give it a name, <coughs> let's call it hello. Now you don't have the slash, but you have this ready uh, prompt, which means you are in a different system than a batch uh, subsystem. At this point, you can enter your program in the, the primary file hello just by typing the, the, the statements with uh, line numbers. So he's going to recognize that as a, an input to the, um, the primary file. So you just type that. Let's say 10, program hello, 20, uh, print star hello world from NOS2, and then 30. Uh, stop, 40, end. Uh, if you made a mistake, you can just uh, type uh, over it, you know. Okay, so if I do list, here, here's my program. If I want to add, let's say, a statement, uh, 25, print, star, uh, another greeting. And now if I do list, like this, here it is. And if I want to run this program or execute, compile and execute, I just run. And here it is, OK? So that's uh, fairly easy. And if I want, I can, if let's say I want to get rid of 25, I just do 25 like this and list. And now 25 is no longer there. And I run. 
And here it is, okay? Now, of course, when you want to do that, you need line numbers like that, and you have to enter this. But I guess this is a pretty typical of BASIC, for example, you know, where the, all the statements are, are written uh, with a line number. So I guess BASIC behaves, uh, the BASIC subsystem behaves the same way. But I, I'm not that much interested with this one, because if you want to write a big program, you know, you have to type this manually, that's pretty long, so you would have to transfer this with line numbers and stuff like that, so I find that using the, the, the batch system is much easier, but it's fun, you know, to explore this. If you want to go back to the batch system, you just type batch, and here comes the, the slash again, okay? I want to discuss uh, two, sub, two topics, namely the file full screen editor and file transfer okay so uh, as i said before i made a connection with uh, iaf or the system through a, a simple telnet you know and all along i manipulate commands and stuff like that but i never edited a file uh, because i don't want to use a primitive editor to do that and if you want to use a uh, a more advanced editor, we have to look uh, about uh, some specific uh, issues, okay? So, uh, and that's what I want to discuss in this uh, particular video. So, um, <clears throat> again, as I said, I don't know exactly how it worked uh, at the time with the cyber, with, if there was a sophisticated terminal that could be used to uh, uh, work on a cyber, but uh, it was certainly possible to connect to a cyber mainframe with a plain ASCII terminal like a VT100. And the VT100 had some full screen capabilities. It was possible to you know to work with the screen and stuff like that, but this was realized typically uh, with the s specific uh, sequences of character, you know, or escape sequences or stuff like that. Uh, so if you wanted to move the cursor or clear or do that kind of stuff uh, at different position on the screen, you had to use a specific, uh, if I remember well, specific um, escape sequence or character sequence to get the result. And this was uh, different from one model, ter terminal model to another, I guess. And uh, the way that NOS 2 will handle this is to my opinion, similar to the way Unix did it, you know, with term info or curses. Uh, with term info or curses, you have essentially this huge database of terminal models, you know, that uh, in, in each terminal is represented by some file which gives all the, uh, the um, specific escape sequence or character sequence to realize different kinds of uh, full screen uh, operation and then what you did you just set the terminal to the uh, model you're using you know and at that point vi is going to work fine or something like that so a similar situation happens with nos2 there is this command called screen and if you specify to screen a, a specific or a certain model of of terminal nos will understand that you have this connection with this particular kind of a terminal and it's going to use the uh, full screen capability of the terminal you know to uh, perform <coughs> uh, full screen <laughs> operation that's in particular you know to make it possible to use a full screen editor so uh, there are a certain number of models supported by this system we have more than we think uh, <coughs> including the vt100 uh, Essentially, all the information regarding the different models is stored in what we call the called a TDU file. That's a terminal definition utility file. All these TDU files are stored in a library somewhere. And if you say, for example, screen VT100, then the system will know use that TDU file for the VT100. And you should be able to do uh, full screen editing from that point. But there's a, a, a caveat or a flaw or some, uh, something we have to be careful because, of course, even if we say a screen VT100, that's fine. 
but we're not connecting a real uh, VT100 to the system anyway. So uh, w what we're connecting is essentially uh, we're using a terminal emulator. It is possible to have a uh, sufficiently sophisticated terminal emulator that's going to emulate the, v the VT100. That's fine. But even then, you might have uh, some problems because you're going to use this terminal emulator on either a PC or a, a, some Linux box or a Macintosh, in my case. And of course, uh, the, the, the keys, the, the keyboard of a Macintosh is not the keyboard of the VT100. So even though uh, <coughs> you have these keys, you know, they may not be uh, answering exactly the way you want. So let me show you uh, how it goes. I'm not going to use the, the terminal window because that's a rather primitive uh, uh, way to emulate a VT100, uh, although it's probably possible, but uh, I'm going to use this uh, uh, commercial emulator called Zuck. That's, uh, but I'm not uh, promoting this one more than another, and I guess it's possible to do what I'm going to explain now with another emulator, either commercial or open source, but just to know what to do, okay. <clears throat> so now I have this uh, emulator and then I'm going to make a connection and as you can see I'm going to connect to the address, uh, the usual address and the usual port with a Telnet connection type and I'm going to emulate the VT100, okay? So I do the connect and I get this. I don't have to type now the mode character, you know, I just press enter. I have the username T Hunter. And then the password, pass me, and I get back my prompt for the batch system. Now, uh, my files are still there, so let me get DOMC, all right? And now, let's say I want to edit this, this guy, so I have first to specify the system, uh, the NOS, that I'm using the a screen mode in VT100, so I do screen Coma VT100. Okay, and that's fine. And now I do FSE full screen editor with the name of the file. Okay. And now I have this. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. <coughs> that's uh, very big. Sorry. Is expecting essentially uh, 132 columns, so that's fine. <coughs> that's something. Uh, that's something, it's inside the TDU file, so uh, <coughs> you have to change the TDU file or change the key to, to modify this. But anyway, let me continue my, uh, my <coughs> demonstration here. So you have the, the content of this, uh, uh, this file in the full screen editor. You can move the cursor, it's uh, right there, uh, over there, you know, with the, the arrows, that goes fine. Uh, you can rewrite, you know, like this, okay, uh, or maybe with uh, capital letters, that's better, for in a way. <coughs> but as you can see, uh, now uncontrolled, and so I'm, I did some stuff, you know, with my, my keys, and it doesn't know exactly what's going on, okay? So even though I have a VT100 emulator, uh, it's not understanding everything coming from my keyboard. All right. So let's say, for example, I move the cursor here and I want to delete this character. Uh, the backspace or the delete uh, key doesn't work. I have to use, as you can see here, uh, F3, actually Shift F3, because Del C, that's del delete character. So to delete the character, I should press Shift F3. But if I do Shift F3 right now, nothing happened. Okay, I'm pressing Shift F3 uh, like mad right now, and nothing happened. Okay, and the reason is, in the TDU file, to get Shift F3 is expecting essentially a, uh, an escape sequence, a specific escape sequence, and that escape sequence is not sent to the computer by the emulator I have. So I need to uh, change uh, to, to change the keyboard definition essentially. So what you do, you come here, 
Well, in this case, we edit the session file profile like this. There's a keyboard like you see, and then you have the PF keys. So I would have you know, to select PF3 like this, edit, and then provide here the proper text so that uh, it's going to behave the way. Now, which text to provide? That depends, you know, on the content of that TDU file. Okay, so let me cancel this maybe for the moment. I'm going to show you the TDU file. Here it is. Uh, maybe I try to make this a little bit bigger. So if we go down here, that's where we learn, for example, that uh, Shift F3 it's actually, he's expecting, you know, 1B exodecimal, ASCII 1B exodecimal, ASCII 4F, ASCII 52. So ASCII 1B is escape, actually. ASCII 4F, that's O, if I remember well, and ASCII uh, 52 exodecimal, that's R, capital R, if I think. Uh, so if I want uh, to that uh, shift key to work properly, I have to code this sequence, you know, uh, in the emulator, essentially. And I also have to add a, a carriage return at the end because I need this carriage return to transfer the, uh, the data to uh, NOS2. Okay, so I did that, for example, uh, for the F8 uh, key, which is the, the PF key that allows you to quit the editor. So, so if I go back here to, uh, sorry, the, is that and choose the keyboard and uh, the F8 is as a star because I edited uh, the, the key. As you can see, I coded escape O, small x and carriage return. Okay, so now if I press F8 with this uh, emulator, he's going to send that sequence and now because that sequence is the, the one that NOS2 is expecting, he's going to perform the action of quitting the the editor. So if I press FK, F8 now, as you can see, I quit the editor. Okay. So uh, if we want to go, go on, you know, with the with the full screen editor, we have to find a TDU file, uh, an, or create one if you wish, you know. And when we have a TDU file, we have to properly, you know, map the keyboard of our PC or the kind of the Macintosh to the the sequence of uh, escape the escape sequence for each of these PF keys properly. So that's a little bit tedious, but it's certainly possible to do it. You know, if we're patient enough, we can do that. Especially with this uh, uh, this um, emulator here, or but many other uh, emulator allows you to customize every uh, small detail uh, of it. So if you're patient enough and you know how to read this uh, definition, you know, you can uh, do that. But if you work on, uh, let me maybe uh, buy this, oh, maybe not yet. <coughs> if you work on the Windows, uh, you can go uh, to my web page over there on NOS 287. And I have here uh, what is called the Patch TerraTerm Pro. So that's a terminal emulator. It's an old version, actually. But Tom Hunter, the one who, the guy who made the system available to us, essentially, you know, in the that document, that Cybus release one documentation, you know, he mentioned that he he actually patched uh, that TerraTerm Pro so that it's gonna work fine with uh, NOS. And he created the TDU file and also uh, adjusted the keyboard file of the terminal uh, emulator. So uh, that's an old version of TerraTem Pro, but it works uh, fine. I installed it myself. So you just download this. That's, gonna, that's a zip, actually. You unzip it. There will be a bunch of files and a setup. So you just install this uh, old version of uh, TerraTem Pro. And then uh, when you want to connect, you know, and use the full screen editor, you just use that terminal emulator. And uh, instead of specifying, of course, a screen uh, VT11, uh, VT100, sorry, you say screen T term. Okay, that's Terra term essentially. And actually the source of that is, is there, you know. That's the, that ST term over there, that's the source of the, 
terminal definition utility file. When you have a source file like this, you can use the tdu command to create uh, the, the compiled version of it that's going to be added to the, the library, the system library of tdu files. So that's what he did. He essentially created this uh, source and uh, uh, adjusted TerraTerm Tro uh, so that it's going to work. So if you want to avoid you know, having to code all these uh, escape sequence and stuff like that, you can, and you're working on Windows, you can use that old, uh, that old uh, TerraTerm Pro. I guess it's possible to adapt this uh, keyboard and everything to a more modern version of TerraTerm Pro or to another uh, terminal emulator, okay? So I, I myself will probably use that Zock over here, yeah. possibly, but I'm not sure yet uh, what I'm going to do. I have the Terratum throw. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, since we are there, uh, not only is there a Terratum Pro, I also put the TDU file of the Deck VT100 uh, in case you want to uh, customize your terminal emulator. Okay. And there is also a zip of all the documentations of the, the starting, the basic manuals, uh, especially the ones I mentioned. And finally, this uh, Windows version here, that's the version of the, the emulator with the smaller console, because if you download the, the version that's already available on the, the site, uh, the Tom Hunter's uh, website, uh, and you start this on Windows, it's going to be a, a pretty large uh, console window. That's fine if you have a desktop, you know, with a large screen. But I had a laptop, and uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the window was too big for my laptop. And because of that, I could not see the command that was uh, the commands I was typing, so it was very annoying. But uh, a nice man uh, compiled a version of it with a smaller window, and it's, it fits inside a, uh, a laptop. So in case uh, the, you find the the window too big, you can download this uh, executable over there. Okay, that so that that's what it is for the full screen editor. The last point I want to discuss is the file transfer because, uh, of course, uh, it's nice to have this, but it could be a long, you know, to just uh, enter a a uh, a file <coughs> uh, from the. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, from an interactive session like this, even though uh, uh, we have a full, even if you have a full screen editor, you know, just entering a, a, a program of 300 lines or 500 lines, it's pretty long. So we would like to find a way to take a program, uh, either basic or Fortran or COBOL or something like that, and be able to take that program on the host and, of course, transfer it on uh, the system. So there are different ways to do that. I don't know if it's possible by FTP. Maybe it is, but I don't know uh, how to do it. I could find two ways. The first, uh, probably the simplest, maybe the more primitive, but certainly the most uh, simple and uh, the most uh, robust, in my opinion, is to use the card reader. So. Uh, that's what I did actually when I was using MVS myself in the beginning and uh, and I made a video about how to transfer data to VM using only the card reader. So that's uh, typically uh, very robust. So what you do essentially, I'm going to show you with this uh, example. Uh, the, here's a job that you can submit to the card reader of the system to transfer a file. And that's very easy indeed. But what you do you just copy the the input into a local file. Remember that uh, what we type here are essentially commands. So I use the command copy. The fact that I have nothing here, you know, an empty uh, entry over there means to use the input. That is to say, what's after that end of record over here. And so I copy the input. That is to say the what's there, the, the next cards, into the local file primes, and then I save primes into an indirect access uh, file, and here it is. Now, of course, there is this uh, local file there, but it's going to de get uh, destroyed at the end, you know? So, uh, so I can just do that to transfer that program, okay? And if I want, I can have 
as I said, uh, you know, several records and several uh, files inside a, a file. So if if I'm okay, I should be able. Let me check uh, cat list. Do I have already that that file? No. So uh, let me push this. Uh, so uh, LC eleven jobs. X for primes that text. So what happened here? Let's see if everything went fine. Apparently, yes. You can see, uh, well, maybe you can't, but it's written one file, one record, 47 words. If I do cat list now, uh, I can see primes over there. That's my file uh, just transferred. Okay. So that's one way, and that's actually the way I did transfer this DOMCJ and that bird and that DOMC over there and this uh, this guy. Uh, it's easier this way. <coughs> and as I said, that's the way I proceeded with MVS in the beginning. Uh, it was uh, pretty easy. So that's one thing. Uh, there's another issue, there's another possibility, you know, on MVS. We have this program called IND file that allows to transfer between the the host and the program. And there's something similar here on NOS2. And guess what? It's X modem. Maybe that's going to remind people uh, some uh, old uh, souvenirs or something like that. So that's an old, that's a dinosaur. So at the time, X modem was a popular uh, transfer uh, uh, utility. So what you can do is use X modem. I believe I put this uh, the information here. No, not yet. I close this, I guess. Uh, let me show. No, not this one. Uh, well, maybe yes. Uh, let's be this one. Is it there? Or? Where are you, baby? Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, let me try to get this guy again. Mm. Okay, uh, that's ref, that's the third one. Let me wait for that. Okay, so file transfer using X modem, uh, that's X, an XP of the. <laughs> so you just use X modem like this uh, with some parameters, and you can initiate a transfer with X modem. So let me show you how to do it with this uh, Zoc over here. So if you do option, there is a submenu file transfer. You can choose the kind of file transfer you use, IND file, but you can use X modem with uh, a checked CRC like this. So uh, what you do, if I'm right, you do X modem. I created a configuration file uh, for it, you have to look at the documentation. So, X modem CFJ. And then it's going to tell you do you want to send or receive? Receive is to uh, transfer a file from the host to uh, NOS2. So, let's say receive. And then he wants the file name, the local file name on NOS2. Let's call it uh, JoJo. Then the kind of file, that's going to be a text file, uppercase only. I suggest that you use uppercase only, it's easier. Now he's ready to receive, so we just go to uh, upload over here, and then desktop maybe, and this guy, uh, Cabello. And it worked apparently, and there's going to be some some crap, but you just type this, and if I do, uh, it's not a, a permanent file yet, but it should be in the, uh, the local file. You have JoJo over there, okay? Uh, like maybe I rewind JoJo, just to be sure, and I list uh, JoJo, or I could copy JoJo, I believe, copy. Jojo, like this, uh, and it's going to copy to output, which is the terminal. So this is a job, you know, in COBOL. Uh, so 
if I run it, it's gonna, I'm going to have a, an hello world from uh, NOS2 in COBOL. Okay, so that's one way to transfer files also. It's to use the X modem uh, protocol. Uh, personally, I prefer <coughs> the um, card reader. It's uh, very simple, very robust, and, and it works fine. But uh, you're welcome to explore this uh, anyway. So I'm going to stop here. I think I have basically covered everything I wanted to talk about this system. Uh, as I said, I provided, just again, I provided a zip of some manuals. They are not perfectly uh, fitted to the system. In some cases, they are slightly older, but that's the best uh, approximation I could find. Anyway, you're willing to, you're welcome, sorry, to, <coughs> sorry, to look at documentation on bit savers, you know, and to the CDC uh, folder or something like that. That's where I took all these... Uh, PDFs anyway, and uh, hope you have fun with NOS2. I certainly had uh, myself, and I'm not done because, as, as I said, this uh, system command manual is 800 pages, and I have just uh, scratched the surface of it. Okay. And hopefully, final wish is that it's we know it's possible to connect uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, the computer to other mainframes either on a local network or on an HNet or something like that. So I hope people will be interested and maybe provide information with that or we have a video about this or people will discuss this uh, on the Discord channel of Mashix. Okay, so I'm stopping here and see you maybe later.